Welcome once again to the library of the Institute for Human Sciences. This is a public event that's being live-streamed. My name is Ivan Weyweda, the acting rector here, and uh, we're having a two-day conference uh, together with St. Anthony's College and Oxford University and the Darendorf program. I'm glad that Timothy Garden Nash, partner in crime here, uh, ha we've been able to put this together and uh, we're beyond COVID times in a sense and very happy to be together. Um, before I introduce uh, our keynote speaker and her uh, work here and, and the commentators, let me just uh, pick up on where we ended the, the last discussion and the words of, of Rosa Balfour, which we take for granted that exactly uh, these kinds of spaces, and Timothy alluded to this, this morning, this institute was created for meetings, for dialogues at that moment in 1982, 40 years ago, meetings between uh, the West, intellectuals, academics, journalists, translators, authors, with East European dissidents. And we carry that tradition and that mission to this day. Uh, open dialogue, polemics, uh, friendly confrontations on a variety of world we use, trying to understand the world that that we're in. Rosa was talking about the fact that this is one of the fundaments on which we stand, and that is why we uphold uh, a certain number of values, freedom, first of all, uh, free speech, freedom of association, and the rule of law. And uh, given the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine, uh, but more importantly, the fact that in Russia, Practically all dissenting views have been curtailed. All or most all independent media have been shut down. NGOs have been either declared foreign agents or have been shut down. Most notably, Memorial, the NGO that is uh, trying to investigate all that happened during the communist period and the totalitarian period, the crimes of, of Stalin, the gulags, and the rest. And the fact that this society under President Putin has been becoming closed and ever more closed and that hundreds of thousands of, of Russians, independent thinking people are leaving is something that we need to remind ourselves. This is, this is a closed society and one uh, which we will have to confront in, in many ways. Whereas Ukraine, uh, this sovereign country that has been invaded, is trying to fight for its sovereignty, uh, for the freedom to exist, uh, and to be an equal partner on, on the world stage. We have, in European history, gone through this. The freedoms that we are talking about have been fought for in the streets and institutions for more than 200 years on the European continent. And those freedoms that we have are ones that we cherish and that we fight for and will fight for if our societies uh, and the leaders whom we elect, elect try to uh, confront them. I remember that some of us here in this room signed a petition when President Putin first clamped down on media and NGOs. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the year exactly that it was in. It was early 2000s, I think. About 100 people, I know that Václav Havel, for example, signed it. So this is, this is not new what's happening, it's simply there, there's a system here. I just wanted to remind ourselves uh, what is the background of, of many things. And so the discussion of Europe in a changing world is also about that. Yes, we are a diminishing continent, 7% of the population going down to 5% in about 10, 20 years. Uh, but trying to not only be, as some of us like to say, the Venice of this world, where people will come to see how life was beautiful, while the rest of the world is, is in more difficult times, but also to uh, try and uphold that. We are here uh, tonight to discuss a paper that uh, has been uh, prepared by our colleague Julia de Klerk Sachse. Look who's talking, telling Europe's story in the U EU capital. Julia de Klerk is currently a visiting senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund, my former home, 
Uh, she was a senior advisor in the strategic planning staff of the European External Action Service, a speechwriter for the EU High Rep, uh, both Catherine Ashton and Federica Mogherini, a Europe's Futures Fellows a year ago, and is a member of the advisory board of the Darendorf Project. Uh, Julia, I'm very glad that we're able to do this after much, much planning. Uh, to comment uh, on uh, her, uh, her work and her paper and about the European narrative are two, I think, eminently qualified uh, speakers. Uh, to the far left is Natalie Tocci. She's the director of the Istituto Affari Internazionali in Rome. Uh, she was, until recently, a special advisor to the high rep of the European Union, Jose Porel, and previously to... Federica Mogherini, and uh, as we all know the public secret, she penned the EU strategy back some years ago. She's an honorary professor at the University of Tübingen and also a member of the advisory board of the Darendorf Forum, and may I add, a transatlantic fellow of the German Marshall Fund some years ago when we, we met. Last but not least, Luke van Middelaar, who is a professor at the University of Leiden. He was also linked and engaged in the European Union as a senior advisor to the president of the EU Council, Hermann von Rompuy, author of uh, several very important books on the European Union, The Passage to Europe, Alarms, and uh, last but not least, Pandemonium, that Tim Gottnash quoted this morning with the subtitle, Saving Europe. But I also quickly looked up, uh, he had an article in 2017 which was entitled Three Things the EU Must Do to Survive. So, Luke, we're looking forward to your instructions on how best to do that. <laughs> but before the comments, Julia, may I invite you to give us the keynote for this evening. Thank you so much, Ivan. Um, for the kind introduction and also for, for bringing us here. I must say, I mean, we've had some in-person events for a while now, but it's still so much joy to look onto real people and not onto a screen while I'm, <laughs> while I'm talking. Um, thanks a lot also to Tim Garten Ash um, for the great cooperation um, within the Europe Studies uh, project that's been running for, for about three years now. It's really been um, great to be part of that, and, and this work is, is a product of that. And also, of course, to, to Natalie and Luke for, for being here, um, both former collaborators uh, in the EU institutions, um, but also both kind of part of um, forging Europe's narrative, um, the EU global strategy. Luke's written several books about that, so it's, uh, I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Now, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how Europe tells its story, um, both how does it conceive of itself, and then also how does it tell that story to the world. Um, since time immemorial, we've been telling stories, right? That's, that's in a way how we make sense of our world. It's how we make sense of ourselves. And that's true in politics just as much as it is in the, in the personal realm. And, and that's also true for the European Union, of course. So the history of, of European integration is also the history of the Union's quest for a narrative from ever closer union to uh, unity and diversity. Europe's always tried to somehow capture the spirit of its age um, to make sense of what it, what it is and also what it's doing and what it should be doing. And of course, I think this sort of storytelling uh, is, is particularly relevant and we're seeing that today in times of crises, right? When you're in a crisis, whether it's a personal or a political one, you need a story to make sense of what's happening around you and what's happening, uh, the, the kind of upheaval you're seeing. And of course, we, for Europe right now, that's such a moment. Um, it's, it's a challenging moment because Europe's actually challenged on two fronts. On one hand, on, at home, We've seen for several years now, um, populists are questioning the foundations of democracy um, and also the, the very value of, of European integration. And, uh, and externally, we're seeing more and more, again, this is nothing new, um, how external powers seek to, to undermine 
democracy within Europe, a cooperation within Europe, um, but also Europe and, and its allies, so divide them. But of course, what's happening now is something that's really been unthinkable uh, for, for so many of us for, for decades, which is an actual hot war on the European continent. And we've been having several discussions already today um, that, that really seems to be a sort of awakening and a, and a huge shock, uh, uh, not just for Europe, but certainly for Europeans. And because, of course, the, the very brutal, and we're seeing, unfortunately, every day now, how, how very brutal th this war is unfolding and an unprovoked attack on Ukraine. It's not just an attack on sovereignty, we've discussed that, and the, the sovereignty of a neighbor, but it's really also an attack on, on the European security order. And, and, of course, Ukraine's president has framed it very much also as an attack on, on Europe itself and the, the very idea of Europe. So in this moment, having a compelling narrative for what Europe is and what it stands for um, has really become existential. It's um, really a matter of who are we. Um, and how to help us think a little bit how we tell that story. So how can Europe tell its story in this moment where so many things are, are being questioned and unraveling? Um, I, I came back, as I often do, <laughs> with fundamental questions to the ancient Greeks and to, to Aristotle, um, one of the ancient masters of rhetoric, who says we basically have three fundamentals of good rhetoric. Um, one is the logos, is what kind of message are you giving? What's the argument that you're making with your story? Uh, the second one is pathos, what's the emotional resonance of your, of your story? And, uh, and the third is the ethos, what's the le legitimacy, what's the authenticity of the, of the speaker? And he really says we need these, these three, those three need to come together to, to forge a convincing narrative, to make for a good story. And I'm going to take these three in turns, I think they're, they're a nice way to help us unpack a little bit um, how Europe tells its story and maybe what's, what's going well and what maybe isn't, isn't so good. So let's start with the logos. Um, I think in times of, in sort of light of this triple shock that, that we've seen, a populist revolt at home, an authoritarian renaissance, um, I was going to say abroad, but it's not just abroad, unfortunately, um, the pandemic, and now this war in Ukraine, um, this Europe's founding narrative as a, as a peace project has never been more relevant. And um, a lot of the first commentary as well was, uh, you know, Europe is, is also back. And, and this is really, this, this brings, this war brings the story back to Europeans. We've just had a panel, does Europe think it's, it's the world? Um, and of course, it's become almost a commonplace to say that the European narrative and the European project has advanced through crises. Every time it has a crisis, it takes one step further towards integration, and it sort of finds itself um, through crises. And in a way, this seems to be borne out through recent events as well, right? We've had a pretty stumbling start in the, in the COVID pandemic, um, but then Europeans actually came together and overcame um, their resistance to um, common borrowing and, and spending. Um, big amounts of money collectively to, to come up with a 700 billion um, euro rescue package and recovery package. Um, on climate change, that's something that's been part of the European narrative for, for many years now. Europe's kind of recast itself now also as not being at the vanguard of that, but then adding sort of the, the economic and energy dimension to it and making it a package in, in the Green Deal. And then, of course, with this war in Ukraine that we're seeing... Europeans actually have shown remarkable resolve and, and unity um, in reacting uh, to, to the Russian aggression in Ukraine and, and almost overnight um, took decisions that really we've been sort of debating for, for decades um, by deciding on, on very stringent economic sanctions, very powerful ones, purchasing arms um, for the first time. We've talked a little bit about, about how Germany is really changed its, its foreign policy stance on that, but also collectively coming together, being inventive on how, how it uses um, instruments to do that. Um, 
And of course, also many countries, but especially neighboring countries, and especially Poland, have been very welcoming to the, to the millions of refugees that have been uh, leaving Ukraine. So there's this image of a, of a Europe that's re-energized and that's found its, its purpose, and that has been inspired by, by the resilience of the U Ukrainian people to fight for its values, right? The values it's enshrined in its treaties, fight for human dignity, freedom, democracy, rule of law. And, and many people said that this, this day that Russia invaded Ukraine, the 24th of February, 22, has sort of changed, is, is a historical change, turning point for Europe. Um, on two ends, I think first people are saying, God, this is the end of, of liberalism, this is terrible. We're seeing this overruling of sovereignty, international laws not being respected. Obviously, this is not the first time, but it, it was so close. But then there were also other voices who were saying almost like this is the end of history, version 2.0, right? <laughs> so we will see that Europe's united, the West's united, and we are, we are going to do this. And, and I would argue neither of that is true. This is actually not the end of either liberalism or the end of history, second coming, but it's the beginning, and it's been there for a while of, of, a, of a period of long contestation that, that we've been seeing emerging. And, and unfortunately, I think this is going to be with us for a long time. Um, and so while this narrative of peace and Europe as a peace project is really still incredibly relevant, I think we need to remember that it's unfolding in a totally changed context, globally and domestically. And um, one of the big changes, of course, is that for a long time we've had this narrative of, um, of interdependence, bringing peace, bringing prosperity. We've talked a lot about that already in the course of today. And, but what we've been seeing over several years now is, of course, that with the financial crises, with the pandemic, with our reliance on both Chinese goods infrastructure, but also now, of course, on, on Russian energy, interdependence is incredibly risky as well and can breed a lot of... A lot of conflict can, of course, also be, be weaponized. So, so that's, uh, that, that's one big change in, in the narrative. Another, of course, is that democracy is not automatically advancing. It's actually been declining around the world. So for se 16 consecutive years now, we've seen um, democracy in, in retreat. So this rekindled enthusiasm for defending democracy um, and, and self-determination isn't actually shared in, in the rest of the world, and certainly not equally. Um, of course, China plays a, a critical role in all this. It's reluctance to, um, to criticize Russia and call out Russia. And, um, but also other countries, and I think there um, people have been maybe more surprised, such as India and South Africa. We've already talked about it earlier which were part of the sort of the democratic club and, and were supposed to be part of the narrative of all democracies coming together, but also, you know, taken, taken a different stance and, um, and not condemned uh, Russian actions outright. So beyond really the immediate allies of Europe, it's going to be a lot harder for, for Europeans to kind of rally others to, to their um, cause. And if if this geopolitical awakening that, that Europe's seen and that it's felt uh, as, as a result of this crisis should actually translate into a proper and much more prominent geopolitical posture, Europe needs to talk to, to the rest of the world uh, um, in a much broader way and in a much more engaging uh, way than it has so far. And one of the things that we're seeing is that the confrontation of, of ideologies that's, that's emerged, this clash, is increasingly playing out also in the realm of words. So it's, it's a lot about, it's, it's a hot war that we're seeing right now, but um, a lot of it is of course also about, about weaponizing stories, about narratives, about disinformation. Um, we've already seen this for a while actually since, since Russia's first uh, um, attack and the invasion of Crimea, um, how, how disinformation played a, a massive role, but also during the COVID-19 pandemic, Russia, but also particularly China, has kind of used narratives to, uh, to tell a very different story of a, of a West that's declining, that's divided, that's way too weak and too slow um, to, to battle the pandemic or, or really get, get anything right. And of course, 
right now in the war in Ukraine, uh, Vladimir Putin's narrative of denazification has played a, a critical role in justifying his, his war in Ukraine, even though Ukraine's president is a Russian-speaking Jew. And one of the, one of the narratives that Europe's come, come back to in the course of, um, of this war is this idea of strategic sovereignty. And, and we've discussed a lot already about, about sovereignty and the renaissance of sovereignty. So to kind of, in realizing its, its great dependence on Russia, to this need to reduce its structural dependence on, um, in the field of energy, of course, but also in defense, it needs to be stronger, it needs to expand more uh, uh, on defense and also protect its infrastructure better. These are just some examples. But of course, again, if you look also at the global picture, why on one hand, Europeans have been quite congratulatory and happy to sort of found this new resolve, this narrative of sovereignty, it, it, it's not necessarily mutually exclusive with cooperating with the rest of the world, but it is a very fine line to tread. And again, it doesn't resonate equally around the world. And um, another part of the narrative, I think, that, that's maybe a little bit more tricky about this renaissance of the, the peace project is, of course, that um, Europe needs to convince the rest of the world that it's not hypocritical and it doesn't have double standards when it talks about universal human rights and, um, and dignity. And I think people around the globe also, of course, in Europe were quick to pick up, again, something we've discussed in the previous panel, how white Christian refugees from Ukraine were welcomed with open arms when just years before um, they, they were facing uh, Syrians who also were bombed out by Russians, by the way, of their country had, had a much, not in every country of Europe, this is not hom homogenous, of course, but had a very different experience. And we've seen even within Ukraine how it was difficult um, for, for residents of Ukraine that were of color or, or um, of a different nationality that didn't have the same experience that were actually prevented from leaving the country. So these things, um, if, if this discourse on, uh, about universal human rights and universal um, values is supposed to resonate, it really, Europe really needs to make sure that also the reality looks the same because otherwise, of course, it feeds into to a narrative um, of, of Western white hypocrisy that, that's uh, part both of the Chinese and, and the Russian narratives. And I think to, to tell this story in a more, more convincing way or for Europe to have a, a broader appeal with its peace narrative and, and sort of renaissance of, of defense of democracy and universal rights, one of the things it really needs to do is, is confronting its own colonial past. Again, we've just had a quite a spirited <laughs> discussion about that. I think that's really essential. The echoes of colonialism still impede a lot of the work uh, uh, that Europe is trying to do with parts of the Middle East, of Africa, and Asia. And I, I've seen this in my work at the, the European External Action Service. I think people don't realize, and that's something where we can be very self-referential, what a big role that plays. And so changing um, that discourse and, and really openly confronting its, its past and making it part of the narrative, I think, will be a, a crucial factor of winning over a, a broader uh, coalition of countries rather than the immediate Europe and allies. And, and the, sort of, I don't really like even the, the discussion of the, of the West, but yeah, the sort of narrowly defined West. And um, at the same time, though, I think what, what Europe can do and is also to, to really call out uh, much more forcefully the, the neo-imperial posture of, of Russia and also the Chinese in many ways in terms of trying the, this idea of spheres of influence, China's exploitation of raw materials and so on. And, um, and it's actually been an African ambassador, the Kenyan ambassador to the United Nations, uh, Martin Kimani, who's done this really very forcefully and eff effectfully uh, in, in his speech at the United Nations, where he sort of accused Russia of stoking the, the embers of past empires. And I think this is something... Europe's story will always be ambiguous, but it can embrace its own dark past, but then also kind of use that to project a, a different kind of future. And I think that will have to be a core part of the story um, that, that is being told to the world. 
I think one of the aspects that Europe also needs to think about and rethink in a way, it's, it's narrative on enlargement, of course. The war, again, has put that on the table, but it's, it's been there for a long um, time, is um, what do you do with countries who really passionately want to join the European Union? Um, Rosa Belfort, I think, talked about it in the previous panel as well, where sometimes enthusiasm for Europe was stronger outside Europe than it was within the Union. And I think we've seen that certainly with Ukraine in, already in, in 2014, and we're seeing it again. Um, but we've also seen it in some of the Balkan countries, and, and of course there it's, it's been a, a different story, and, and much of that enthusiasm has been, has been disappointed. And so, so considering sort of how do you deal now with this plea for membership, of Ukraine, but then also how do you deal with countries such as Serbia, who um, are on a track to become members, but then openly court China and, and Russia. And, and we've just had elections there, and they, they tell a very different story to then the, the Ukrainian story <laughs> and wanting to, and the defense of democracy. And so I think these are the, the two sides of the coin as well. And I think a, a third element maybe is to look at how, you know, how does Europe look at its own challenges with democracy. Again, we've had elections in Hungary just now. Um, and, and it's not a black and white, a black and white picture, and sort of standing up to, to these challenges to democracy within its union will be crucial. And again, it's been something where, where the union has been quite, quite ambivalent about, and it cannot throw that out of the window now, um, certainly when it comes to Hungary, but also to Poland, which is, is a crucial partner now in this. And I think sort of being committed um, to, to the values that it proclaims will be essential uh, in, in resonating also in the world. I mean, it cannot... And that doesn't mean being perfect, by the way. I think actually a good narrative there is one of humility and to say, look, this is a shared challenge that we have, but these are the things that we, we believe in. Um, and it's not easy, um, but this is something that we want to do together rather than we are a model, which has been for many years the narrative to the rest of the world and look at us and you can become, you too can become like, um, like us. So that's sort of part of the narrative um, that, that Europe can tell to its, both its citizens and the world. I think to the citizens, again, the, the ingredients are, are there. There's a, during the pandemic, uh, there has been this focus on recovery. There's now a big pack of money on the table. It will now, we'll see how, how this is distributed. But there is uh, something to speak for intra-European solidarity. Um, and also, of course, on climate change. That's another priority that still, despite the pandemic and, and with the war, almost become the fight for more sustainable and, and greener energies has become even more important. That's something that Europeans really care about. And there's a good story um, to tell there. I think one of the things we need to be very careful about is something that Europe's great at is to, to make big promises and to tell big narratives about all the things it's going to do and to sort of over-promise and under-deliver. And I think here, again, with those recovery and, and climate narratives, it has to be really, really careful not to do that. And some sort of humility and honesty is also important there in terms of preparing... Europeans for, for what's at stake here. And um, there is, of course, the positive dimension of that, but at the same time, and a lot of you have said that in the conversations that we've had over lunch and in the courses, Europe's doing everything at the moment, right? So it's fighting for democracy, it's fighting on the right side of the war, it's delivering arms. At the same time, it's helping like boost an economic recovery within Europe. It's spending more on defense, it's greening at its economy, um, that all will create winners and losers, um, and that, that will cost a lot of money as well. So th these are tricky things to, to do, and you need to really prepare your populations for that. And I think you need to probably have um, some, some honesty about that this is going to be hard as well, and, and that there are choices to be made, and not all of them will be easy. And, and there will certainly, in the short term, be some sacrifices um, to make. So what we need really is a narrative that not only aspires to all the great things that we can do, but also inspires um, real political change and real political will on, on driving that change. And that's where we get to the second part of the good narrative, which is the, the pathos, the, the emotions, if you will. Because of course, 
a good story shouldn't just tell you facts, but it's also supposed to convince. And, and if, if done well, it really has the power to, to mobilize action. But when we're looking at how, how Europe's story is told within the European institutions and also how it's being made, if you will, um, the main principle is still very much it's seen through the lens of information rather than convincing people. And, and the, the kind of way the institutions tell their story is very often very fact-based and very rational. And um, th there's a place for that, but it, it comes at the cost of a more emotive form of communication. And I think right now, we've seen in these things that I've already outlined, I mean, with these crises that we've seen, the, the financial crisis, the pandemic, now there's a real war. These are very emotive things, right? These are about the, the money that's in our pockets. This is about... Um, on migration is who are we on enlargement the same who gets to be European um, and but with both with the pandemic and the and the war it's about life and death if you will right so these are really essential um, big questions that you can frame in in a much more empathetic way than simply putting out statistics on here's the benefits the economic benefits of EU membership or uh, this is what makes you a good European citizen. So underestimating this affective dimension, the emotional dimension, um, it is really a, a problem and, and comes at the cost both of reaching its citizens and, and possibly also resonating more widely in, in the world. And I think the limits of this approach of being sort of fact-based communication we've seen both in Brexit um, but also with the election of, of Donald Trump, this was not in Europe, but where you know people were so surprised. It's like, but all the arguments were on our side. Well, guess what? You know, there's different different things that make a good argument, and um, of course, it's not just we shouldn't just leave this field of emotions to to populists who've been very good at, at mobilizing that. Um, but there's also a good good examples of, of uh, positive emotional narratives. Barack Obama is a good example. Of course, Zelensky right now, right? This is a very, he's, he's mastered that as well. So I think this is something um, that needs to, needs to be given a lot more emphasis. And in fact, even, even scientific research has shown that. So there's, there's a really famous experiment at Stanford University that shows once people have made up their minds, facts actually will, not, will make them not change their minds at all. And so even if you're presented, even if you have a, a fatal illness or something, you're pre presented with all the facts, what you need to do, it's not going to do it. It's, you really have to appeal to people how they feel about themselves, or their identity, or, or their emotions um, to, to, to get to them. Another part, apart from the um, emotional deficit, is, is also the language that Europe uh, uses to tell its story. And here Luke has, has, has written about that. I think we've all dealt with that because we've all been writing <laughs> also for the European institutions, right? We've been part of writing um, Europe's story. And um, a lot of the speech writers and spokespeople and so on that I interviewed for, for this project told me, yeah, they're very, actually, there's a very limited set of words that you can use to even talk about the European Union. There's a limited vocabulary. Um, that's deemed European, so to say. And, and Luke's put this very nicely in, in his book, where he says, in Brussels, entirely normal words, such as power, national interest, and cultural difference, are beyond the boundaries of what can be said. And so I think while Europe has evolved as a political project from a, a very bureaucratic one, the language has not actually evolved. And also the approach to how you use language has not evolved. So we're in a... In a political project now in a highly politicized geopolitical environment, but the, the way that you look at communication is still you're informing, you're putting out facts, and you're using fairly neutral language um, to do that. Um, another part in the institutions, I think that's also a problem, is, is I think Tim coined that phrase, uh, the, the sort of track change problem when I talked to him about some of the experience I had, which is that Europe's 
realize it needs better communicators, so it hires talented speechwriters, and then some are lucky and have access to, to their leaders, and others it puts in some sort of communications unit, so they write a, a glowing speech. I used to give a lot of trainings on, on speech writing and how to forge a good narrative, and they said, well, by the time my speech gets to the boss, so there's about 15 people who have nothing to do with communication, who've done track changes, and <laughs> the track changes problem, to this speech, and it's, it's totally unrecognizable, and to be honest, also unpronounceable. It's no longer <laughs> <laughs> the speech that I wrote. So I think there you also need to be more consistent. If you hire talented communicators, give them the political access and give them the power to exercise their craft because otherwise you're really, you're really undermining um, uh, the very purpose of, of a more sort of outward-looking communication. And I think here you still have... Sort of say, you know, message control still trumps message resonance. It's still at the end of the day, we just have to make sure this can't, you know, that this cannot raise any controversy. And this has to be, and or you know, very factual, and and otherwise we we make ourselves vulnerable. And um, there's a certain degree of risk averseness in that, but I think that the the point uh, that I've tried to make certainly in my time as a, as a speechwriter, but also now, and we're seeing this now, is that of course not like saying things and not maybe polarizing even is also incredibly risky because again, we've spent like a morning already to say that people then either don't listen to you at all, they don't hear you, that's a problem for you if you're fighting an existential uh, fight. Um, or, or they call you hypocritical, or they, they don't, your like, message doesn't land. So it's really, it's actually uh, important to, to go out there and, and to, to take those risks. Otherwise, you don't, you're not credible. And that brings me to the, to the third element um, of uh, the ethos. So who's, who's a good community, who's legitimate and, um, and also seen as an authentic speaker. And um, I think... That is also a critical role because, of course, communication, again, it's not just sharing information. It's really building public support for big political changes. And when, if not now, I mean, this is really a transformational moment that we're seeing also in terms of our politics. You really need to use communication to do that. Um, and I think one of the embodiments, again, and this is very much now, of course, uh, formed by current events as President Zelensky of Ukraine, who is, has sort of used his, his persona um, and to directly appeal to people. And I think, um, Tim, you made that point to sort of say, you know, this is now your moment for you Europeans to show us that you're in fact European. So appeal to the identity of the other person um, and, and really make it about, about the ethos. Who are you um, as, a, as a person? And again, here I think Europeans, the institutions are often holding back quite a lot. And in some ways, I think that's understandable because, of course, when you work in the European institutions, when you're a European politician, you, you kind of get it from both sides. You know, on one hand, you're constantly questioned by, by populists or people who don't believe in European integration, which, by the way, is not the same thing. I think that's something that's really important to say as well. Um, but you, you sort of in the defensive from the beginning, and then of course you're also competing with national politicians who, for better or worse, often still frame it as us versus them, and there's Brussels and here's us, and and so you're in the defensive. You don't make you want to make yourself even more vulnerable by telling a sort of personal story or maybe saying something that's slightly controversial. But again, by not doing that, you're actually taking an even bigger risk, I would say, because you you really risk irrelevance. Um, which uh, in these times when people are not your friends is um, just as much of an existential risk as exposing yourself. Um, I think the pandemic is maybe a good example where there were a lot of missed opportunities for both a sort of more emotional and, and authentic approach um, and where we've, we've seen the shortcomings of that narrative because... In a way, the story was all about wrangling first about first border closures. Um, so the first thing people shut down their countries, and then they didn't. They wrangled over masks and vaccines. Um, and and in Italy, Natalie will know this better than I do. You know, in the in, at the beginning of the pandemic, at least. People thought China was the more reliable partner because they were actually giving masks rather than hugging them for themselves. Or, and again, come back to Serbia, you know, President Vucic sort of 
uh, stood side by side with Xi Jinping saying, this is, you know, we're going to do this, when, when at the same time accepting sums of money from the European Union that are multiple times of what they're getting from, from China. And so, so then these ideas, and, and Europe at the same time kept talking about Team Europe and how we're evacuating people, and, and actually they're doing amazing things. They were sharing vaccines, still are, you know, um, with, the, with the world. Um, but all of that kind of story just didn't, didn't land at all because, because of the way that the story was told. Um, Ursula von der Leyen, the, the president of the European Commission, gave a State of the Union speech uh, at the height of the pandemic. And she said all the right things in many ways. You know, she talked about recovery. She talked about the Green Deal. She talked about all the priorities um, that European citizens care for. But she didn't make it personal at all. She didn't talk about herself at all. She's a doctor. She's a mother. Um, she's a, a European who speaks several languages. That didn't come out at all. So again, there, there was no kind of hook for people to come into, and it ended up being more like a, a sort of political program than a speech. Again, I mean, this was at, at the height of the pandemic. The U.S. was still governed by Donald Trump. This was quite an existential moment, and it didn't, it, it kind of fell flat. And I think that's, um, that's a real shame. So this, this necessity to take risks and put yourself out there is really a, a crucial part of telling the story. And the last one that I think is really crucial is, is the diversity of who gets to tell the story. I think we've had that a little bit in the past panel as well, is who are the people that speak. And on the whole, there are some notable exceptions, but unfortunately very few. Europe still looks kind of middle-aged, white and male to the rest of the world <laughs> and to its own citizens. And I mean, that's not even what Europe looks like, let alone will it resonate with the rest of the world. So. Again, I think this kind of idea of message control and hierarchies within institutions, it's often the senior management that gets to speak. Communication is not just for them. There's certain parts where there's diplomatic protocol where that matters. But for the rest, you can actually present a much more diverse, and you should, diverse face of Europe. That means maybe making the institutions look a little bit more diverse, hiring different people, but even the people that are already there um, giving them the chance to actually speak publicly, and it shouldn't just be certain people. Um, so people of a much wider background, so that the people who are speaking actually reflect the society that you're talking to. Because I think it's quite natural. You're going to identify with the person that's out there. And I think, again, it's in the society that's a problem, and also, of course, to the rest of the world. I think we've talked about colonialism. I, me too, if, if they see a sort of middle-aged white man talking about all these things to the rest of the world, uh, many parts of the world that have suffered at the hands of, of white paternalism, that will not resonate. So we, we also need a different picture of Europe. And the last one that I think the last ingredient is really important is listening more. And it also plays in, into that, is especially when it talks to the rest of the world. Is Europe can be incredibly self-referential still. And I think that's partly because... Speaking as Europeans is so hard, right? And making European politics is so difficult, coming to a consensus of 27. So a lot, again, is always about unity. We're united. You know, we made this together. Look at us. And of course, it's great, but at the end of the day, you know, that's good, good for you. If I'm <laughs> at the other side, that, that's kind of your, your part of the game, right? I want to know, like, what you're going to do with me. And um, what's my part in this story? And that Europe sometimes forgets, I think, sometimes willingly and sometimes not willingly. So part of that is, again, right. echoes of colonialism and so on, and maybe of self-referentialism. And sometimes they just don't see it because they've so much focused their energy on, on working together that they forget that there's actually a, a counterpart. Um, so, yeah, to conclude, I think Europe does, does still have a story to tell in these times of crisis, and I think it is, it is great to see that in, it, it sort of rallied itself and acted much more quickly than, than uh, we expected in many ways. But really, in that respect, I think, yeah, mistaking its unity and decisiveness, that is the beginning of the story. It's not the end of the story. And I think um, it, only if it's aware of that and if it expends a lot more energy uh, on speaking outwards to its own populations, but also to the rest of the world, um, will it be able to, to kind of 
also then produce these, these kind of transformations that will be necessary. And in a way, we've heard that from, from the high representative, you know, in this age of geopolitical competition, we need to learn the language of power. I mean, first of all, I think the high representative should speak the language of power and not say that we need to learn it. Um, but we really, first of all, we need to discover the power of language, right, to be able to make make that argument. So I think only if we, we start also employing the power of language in a, in a much more consistent way can, can we project a narrative that will resonate um, beyond the immediate Brussels circles. Thanks so much. Julia, Julia, thank you very much for that comprehensive overview. We've all been either on the receiving end or making input into or trying to convince the European Union to say things or not to say things. But it's wonderful to have your insider view and now that you've stepped out also this reflection on, on that experience and, and lots, lots obviously to discuss. So uh, let me ask Natalie to be the first to comment. Well, thank you, Ivan and Julia. I love the paper. Uh, so that's the first thing I, I want to say. And it made my plane journey this morning extremely enjoyable. <laughs> um, I also think that the way you organized it through the logos, the pathos and the ethos was extremely compelling. Um, and I think that <clears throat> when it comes to the logos, we were, were not in a bad place. Um, when it comes to the pathos, we could improve, but there's um, a, a possibility there, which I think you highlight, meaning the times that we're living in. I think where the problem really lies uh, is in the ethos uh, part. And I'll, I'll, I'll come to this um, at the end of what I wanted to say. So I think as far as the, the, the logos is concerned, I mean, the story, the content, uh, I think that the way in which Europeans, or rather the European Union, has rediscovered three key words um, is really making over, you know, basically since the pandemic and now with the war, um, is really making a big difference. So I think that um, first with the pandemic, now with the war, with, we've rediscovered the magic little word of solidarity. We had forgotten that word. We had forgotten it with the Eurozone crisis. We had forgotten it with the so-called migration crisis. We rediscovered it uh, with, with the pandemic. We rediscovered it uh, through, uh, through this war. Um, and through the rediscovery of the word solidarity, we rediscovered the fact that we're a community of fate, essentially. So that's one piece of, of good news. Second piece of good news is that we've rediscovered the word democracy and freedom. And in a sense, it's Ukraine that has reminded us of the importance of the words of, of, of democracy and freedom, um, which lie or are supposed to lie at the foundations of, um, of the European uh, project. And that's another uh, sort of piece of, uh, of good news. I think more recently, we've also rediscovered the word openness. And now we had definitely forgotten about the word openness. And now here we are, and we talked about it in the last panel, uh, talking about enlargement once again. Enlargement as a political project, and it always was a political project, was basically kind of dead in the water. Uh, and here it is reliving once again. And we don't know whether it's going to actually come to fruition or not, but the idea of enlargement and therefore the idea of a European project, which is an open project, uh, is, is, is something which is reliving once again. Now, precisely because all of this is happening, as Julia, you were saying, at times in which, you know, first with the pandemic, now with war, this is life or death stuff. Um, the pathos is, I think, if there are sort of people willing and able to express it, there to be, you know, to, I mean, th th that is something there to be found, there to be reaped. I think the problem is, is really when we come to the ethos. And I think we've been kind of going around this question over the course of, uh, of the whole afternoon, basically. Uh, and here, basically, uh, the, the point is that although we've rediscovered this words, um, 
It is also true that we haven't rediscovered them enough. So yes, we have rediscovered uh, solidarity, but how about, I mean, let alone the Syrian refugees a few years ago, but what about the non-Ukrainian nationals from Ukraine, as your paper uh, points out? So we've rediscovered solidarity, but we haven't really rediscovered it uh, enough. Um, you know, I was in Doha last, last week and you know, I was having conversations with um, Palestinian colleagues and, you know, they were kind of looking at me saying, ah, now resistance is a good word, is it? Uh, now those children throwing Molotov cocktails, you know, now, now that's good, isn't it? Uh, yeah, how do you engage with, with that? So, you know, uh, we've rediscovered uh, democracy, um, but, you know, and we were talking about it in the earlier panel, here we are having to probably, you know, Hungary is one thing, but probably have to close one eye, one and a half, uh, on, on Poland. Uh, so, so how does that, you know, how, you know, how does that fit into, uh, into the democracy uh, sort of story? We also, rightly, uh, in energy terms, uh, need to absolutely sever that fossil relationship with Russia. Uh, but here we are knocking on Algeria and Qatar and Azerbaijan's door, hmm? uh, which we have to do. Uh, but, but how does that fit with the democracy story that uh, we, uh, we have and we, we need to tell? Um, and then, of course, there's the, the, the openness part, and that is probably the most problematic at all, because all of this is actually coexisting at a time in which, you know, um, closure is still alive and kicking, uh, be it in terms of trade, be it in terms of migration, um, be it in terms of, of, of defense. You know, this is actually all about protection uh, as much as it is about openness. So the question really is, you know, how do we embrace that contradiction. And I think we need to embrace that contradiction because unless we do, we end up going uh, to the situation that we're living in now and therefore the war in Ukraine and Putin's narrative, um, we end up actually fueling exactly the narrative that Putin is trying to pursue, which is the West versus rest. So I think unless we somehow find a way of embracing that contradiction, rather than being able to tell that broader global story, which is not one of West versus rest, but one of West versus Russia, North Korea, uh, Syria, Belarus, uh, and Eritrea, and a rest in between. And that rest is made of many shades of gray. And I think the only way to, ex you know, sort of... Uh, uh, move towards that, that, that vision of the world is that of listening and self-criticizing without this kind of tipping into moral equivalence. Um, it's a very difficult line to walk, which is why, and, and here I'll end because I don't know how to do it, <laughs> but the ethos part of it, I think, is the most difficult part of, of, of the story to get right. Thanks a lot. Natalie, lots of, lots of questions there, uh, which we'll surely discuss. Uh, Luke. Well, thank you, Eva, <laughs> <laughs> and and thank you for the for the invitation uh, to all of you who contributed. It's always a pleasure to be in this beautiful library, impressed by all these books, because you even have the impression that there are these not only people in front of you, but also people in the back of you who can yeah, yeah. who are make Lots their presence felt. Thank you, uh, Julia, for the for the for the paper, which, like Natalie, I I uh, read with a lot of. Uh, Pleasure, and I, I found a lot in which I could uh, recognize myself, in particular in, in what you said about uh, the craft of uh, uh, the wordsmiths in, in Brussels. Now, even what I wanted to do, I have a series of, of remarks, basically four points, going from the very practical to the more theoretical and linking back to what we discussed earlier this afternoon. So. They risk also getting longer as I go along, okay. so you will you will stop me there. But I, I want to start with with the very practical, indeed, as you, uh, which is the craft of of, of the speech writing. And there, as I said, Julia, I I, I uh, entirely uh, agree, and it's very uh, convincing how you explain the incapacity or difficulty the EU has in talking a language which not only informs but also also persuades. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the difficulty to cut through bureaucratic layers, the fear, uh, which is sometimes omnipresent, the taboos on a lot of words. Indeed, uh, you, quote, you quoted me there, and, and I can tell you one of, one of the little anecdotes between a sentence like that in, in a book of mine. I remember once I had written a speech for, for Van Rompuy, actually for, for Chatham House, uh, Hans. It was a foreign policy speech. Uh, mid 2012, and what you do? I was a speechwriter. I made sure that I uh, held the pen in a direct link with with the president. But of course, you share with with colleagues, so the diplomat colleagues would, would would read this kind of speech. And and one colleague, she came storming into my office. She was very very upset and said, <laughs> "Look, why do you use all these horrible words <laughs> like power? And why do you talk about our colonial past?" I said, "Well." <laughs> it's a foreign policy speech, uh, what you want. So, uh, I mean, I don't know how we ended the conversation, but, but uh, I have had many small experiences of, of, of this kind, which, which, which are instructive. So that was on the, on the craft where I, I think w what you say is really uh, um, useful. Second point on spokesmanship. I think when telling the story, it's also important to talk about the spokesmanship. Who speaks on behalf of Europe? And is it only EU actors on which mm. you focus? Or can also national leaders speak on behalf mm. of Europe? And here I was just thinking, but there's an interesting difference between speaking on behalf of Europe internally and externally. Internally, it's very problematic if you have the German Chancellor doing European policy also for the voters in Greece and Portugal, right, to put it very simply. Uh, there you need, indeed, EU actors to speak on behalf of European decisions, Brussels actors. But from my point of view, it's different uh, externally. I have personally no problem if the French president is flying to Moscow and to Kiev, or the German chancellor, uh, as they both did uh, when, uh, before the 24th of, of February, to try and, and, and reason uh, to Putin. And clearly, they also do so on behalf of Europe. Yeah. And this is even visible. Uh, I'm a fan of protocol. Uh, I always have to look at the flags uh, which are shown. And for instance, uh, the press conference, shared press conferences uh, Macron and Putin gave in the Kremlin. Putin was standing in front of four Russian flags. Macron also in front of four flags, two European flags, two French flags. Well, you can say, well, this is French presidency this half year, but the same was true a week later, or when was it, 10 days later, when Schultz went, also four flags, two European flags and two German flags. So I think there, these actors realize, and they have to speak on behalf of Europe, and I think that's very important they do so, because EU actors cannot do so, uh, and this is not about individual characters, this, this is really about their institutional position, they cannot speak with the same authority mm. in a situation like that when it is about war and peace as national leaders and uh, leaders like Macron and Schultz, they do so, as I said, on behalf of Europe. So I, 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 I'm relaxed about that. One issue I will skip for now, maybe we have time later, you do not touch upon it, but it's language. Which language do speakers mm. use? And many, including me here, it's not their native tongue makes a massive difference also in terms of ethos, in terms of credibility of the speaker. I saw it with uh, my then political boss, uh, Van Rompuy, who when he arrived, his, his English was rather poor. But that is not just a matter of vocabulary of, or grammar. It is a matter of, of, of the whole body, of the voice, of respiration, and, and therefore the, also the power you can project. And, and I think this is, this, is, this is clearly underestimated. And, uh, well, we, we'll be talking about Zelensky a lot uh, in the weeks ahead, but clearly he speaks Ukrainian to all parliaments he has addressed, and not some crippled English. Huh? So there's language. I smuggle that in. Third point, very important for the, state, for the moment we are now, is, I would call, the emergence of the public. There is now a European public, a Europe-wide public, which did not exist 
to the same extent at least 20 years ago, did not have to exist. Uh, let's not forget that EU integration was boring, and it had to be boring. It was one of its most important qualities that people did not really care, because it was an answer to a surplus of passion and drama and two world wars and all the rest. So all this technocratic uh, language, which is in the EU's DNA, it used to be equality. And now it becomes a handicap, but it explains also why it takes time to come out of it. Now, what has broken the mold of this te technocratic language in the past 50 years, in my analysis, is this whole series of crises from Lehman Brothers, Euro crisis, etc., where political actors were forced to, to act but where also the issues at stake were so divisive, Euro crisis, refugee crisis, so important, so much was at stake in terms of finances, in terms of sovereignty, in terms of identity, that people really cared. There were passionate debates. And in the process, and nobody planned this, and we've maybe all been surprised, there is something like a public sphere emerging, at least at those moments of continental crisis, like the Euro crisis, refugee crisis, Brexit as well, which was followed intensely all across the continent, and the pandemic as well, when I would go as far as to say that it was really a public outcry from Italy in particular and, and Spain and, and elsewhere, which triggered a massive policy change in Germany, which did not happen 10 years earlier. So, in a way, as a result of all these crises, a stage has been built, one could say, and here comes the actor, huh? Zelensky, is the first one to properly and truly exploit that pan-European space. Uh, he has addressed, well, last time I checked, it was 16 uh, parliaments, maybe more um, uh, in the meantime. He started, interestingly, 1st of March with the European Parliament. A lot of other uh, parliaments after that, Bundestag, Assemblée Nationale, Lower House, Tweede Kamer, the Netherlands, etc. Uh, Rome as well. And... Um, so he, he, can, he can build on, on that sphere which, which, does not, which does not exist. So that's my point on the emergence of the public. Now I come to my fourth and final point, Eva, which is on the story and which is on, on, on the logos. Now, Julia, I agree with what you say, I mean, on substance, what you say on most of on enlargement and, and the Green Deal, etc. But, but I think the issue here is maybe a little bit more more fundamental, and it, and it links back to the discussion we had before the break and to the issue of universalism. Because I think storytelling is, in a way, deeply political, historical, and plural. Storytelling presupposes a plural wor world, or if you want, even a multipolar world. Because it is a story of, of a character uh, taking place in time at a certain space. It often presupposes a us and a them. And, and that's why a universal narrative is, is very difficult. Now you can say, or you can say, or you can say, well, what about the US? Uh, they have a clearly a universalist message. True enough, but uh, you could also say that the U.S. always needs another, needs an enemy, and in a way it is a bipolar narrative, it's a good and evil yes. narrative, it's a Hollywoodian narrative, if you uh, allow me to, to push the point a little bit, or a Manichaean if you want something more sophisticated, uh, where, where, where the U.S., uh, as military power has has an opponent and um, which is hitler or or, or Saddam hussein or 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 the man whom President Biden called a butcher uh, today now Europe is a little bit different because we do a universal message without enemy huh? so or, or, or and then we say uh, then we get into the not yet language uh, they are heretics. Uh, which is language Juncker used for, for Brexiteers. Uh, they have not yet understood. Uh, so it is a kind of universal universalism, but without the, the hard edge of, of the American universalism. 
Now, and in this context, I, I must say, I have some sympathy work for what you may or may not call a civilizational turn uh, of European politics, because it's basically an attempt to answer the question, as you also uh, asked, Julia, who are we? The whole world is asking itself this question, who are we and why should we not also ask ourselves uh, that, that, that question? Uh, we cannot be the only ones not asking it. But there, as, as Ivan uh, Krasov said earlier, we, we ask that question and we know that we speak a universal language which is declining and in a way the problem will may, maybe therefore uh, be solved automatically because we will be uh, regional uh, all by ourselves. Now, maybe I, I should stop here and... and um, no, maybe ma 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 make one, one point, because we, we have discussed it a lot this afternoon also. What, and, and both of you talked about it. What do we make of the uh, very warm reception of uh, Ukrainian refugees in, in, in Poland and other neighboring nations compared to what happened to the Syrian refugees? in 2015, 2016. Yes, definitely very awkward. But I think we should not deny what is happening there, as, let's say, as political analysts, uh, we, we don't have to applaud. Uh, and there you see something like maybe the sociological limits of, 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 of uh, un universalism. And uh, when von der Leyen says, bringing the issue of Ukrainian membership on the table, eh, they belong with us, they are part of the family, clearly that's not something she, she, uh, she would say to, to countries of Africa, um, which in the past, uh, there's only one time when the EU uh, has given a non-ambiguous answer to those kind of issues, which is when the Moroccan king Hassan II wrote a letter in the mid-1980s, asking for membership in the wake of, uh, of Portugal and, and Spain. And, uh, and, and, and he, he got the answer, uh, uh, your majesty or whatever, uh, but you're not in Europe. The geographic answer uh, uh, cl uh, clinched that. To conclude this storytelling in a plural world, uh, in a specific place, which therefore also needs borders, preferably, and in a specific time, which preferably uh, has a, uh, a future, but the storytelling, I think, would help us deal with the kind of issues and dilemmas you rightly raise, uh, Natalie, um, because storytelling, as we have known since the Greeks, is also about tragic dilemmas. Mm. It's about having to choose between two bad things. Mm. Uh, this is uh, Antigone and Sophocles, and, and uh, yes, uh, okay, uh, we don't want to buy Russian gas, so we go to Qatar, mm. yes. That's Europe. Uh, that is also who we are in a way, you know, and, and maybe we should, uh, final sentence, huh? a pride of Europeans could be that we have thought about these kind of dilemmas since two and a half millennia. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Luke. Um, Julia, do you want to react immediately? Yeah, I mean, or a lot of things, just to briefly, because I really want to bring in the basket of the room as well, but maybe Luke, just to pick you up on conference is this sort of, I think the dilemma for the Europeans, it's a sort of regional project, but with universal values. And can that be reconciled in a narrative or can it not? And also in the politics that it projects. And I think with now refugees and, and enlargement, again, we're, we're seeing kind of that's really where it's rubbing against that. But, and you talked a lot about othering, which of course is important in terms of storytelling and identity. But I do think that it is possible to have universal values and to stand for universal values and, and tell a good story about that. I don't think that there's a problem with that for Europeans. And I think the othering that you do there is the people that don't respect those, those values. And I think there you really do have an audience, and maybe I'm naive, but you have an audience in the rest of the world. And I think you're seeing that with Ukraine, but there's so many people around the world that still believe in these values. And, you know, I don't think uh, President Putin speaks for all of Russia. So I, I think it's really, we need to be careful that we don't have sort of certain governments don't speak for, for their nation and that the kind of othering that you do, you know, and I think you can, and this is a good moment to, to start. Um, 
to, to really kind of reinforce, and Natalia, you spoke about that, you know, we rediscover these values that we have, and I think that is a good thing. I think where we really need to be careful is, of course, that, and where we play into Russian and, and in a degree also Chinese narratives, is when then, you know, some, some animals are more equal than others, which, it, it, by the way, is also not new, right? I mean, talk to a lot of Central and Eastern Europeans within the European Union when it comes to how different standards uh, are being applied and, and so on. So I think that that is a problem within the European Union and it's certainly how Europe speaks to the to the rest of the world and that really should be careful. Again, there is this colonial heritage which, which kind of magnifies that. But um, I think that is a challenge, but it's not one that kind of fundam cannot be resolved theoretically and analytically, you know, I don't think there's a fundamental contradiction. It's a practical one that we're seeing right now, but I do think you can make a compelling case um, for universal values and for a regional project that can, can advocate these, these universal values um, as well. Yeah, maybe on the rest I have a lot, but I'm sure we'll come back to some of that in, in the questions and, and the discussion with the rest of the room as well. Okay, thank you, Julia. Let's open it up. Uh, Ivan Krust at first. Uh, two things which I find uh, are important and interesting. What always struck me in the European Union discourses, and uh, I, uh, uh, Bagger made it very good also for, uh, for the Germans, there is no distinctions between the normative and the analytical. For example, when we say, for example, Assad should go, it can have two different meanings. Our analysis shows that he cannot survive. He's, and the second is, if God existed, he, he's going to fire him. This kind of a story that for us, the normative is analytical, is creating a policy issue. Because others are listening to a policy, while as President Biden is saying, I'm speaking my heart. But when you're starting not to know when you're speaking policy and when you're speaking your heart, this creates a problem, particularly in the societies in which there is an emerging European public. And secondly, and in my view, this is very much related to what is happening these days. Uh, Europe is going to have more and more problems to speak about peace as a common project for several reasons. One, all the experience of the World War II has been so brutalized of what is happening denazifying, doing this, doing that, certain type of a language starts to have a basically impossibility to be used. In a certain way, poisoning of a language that was a common language. It was a language even common between Russia and the European Union, between everything, because it was a common experience. So you're ending up with a situation in which every war in Europe is a civil war, because we became so close and because of internet, but secondly, every war is as if we're fighting the World War II again. And this comes my question about the peace project. I expect in two months, the people who are going basically to try to make a deal with Putin to speak peace. And the others who are basically going to insist to fight to speak justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and the European discourse, how it's possible that on every conflict we say that there is no military option, and now suddenly we're going to say, basically, it's not up to us to decide what the Ukrainians are going to get. I'm pushing this question because from this point of view, I also see a change. Certain things that rhetorically have been possible before, now out of this crisis, not only the war. It started with the financial economic crisis, it started with this and that, but certain words cannot be used anymore in the way they're words in order to mobilize anybody. So this is my story, that you said that we're discovering words. We're discovering words, but we're also retiring words. Yes. Let me collect a few questions. Uh, we go to Hans. No, no, over there. <laughs> Next to <clears throat> Thanks. Um, two things. Um, first of all, I guess I'd like to challenge the premise a little bit that Europe needs a narrative. Um, and, and so I don't know if there's empirical work on this, um, but my impression is that there's this need, <laughs> you know, this need is felt very strongly at the moment that Europe needs a narrative, but I don't think it was always the case. And by the way, apologies, Luke, this is an argument. You've, I've made this argument to you in a response to, to an interview that you gave. So you've heard some of this before, but it seems to me that 
what's happened is that now suddenly we feel the need for a narrative because actually we've lost what the EU used to stand for. And it was kind of obvious, and we didn't need a narrative before, and I think that was two things. Firstly, it was the mode of governance, the depoliticization that Luke talked about. Um, but I think what's now happened is we've come to see that that's problematic from a democratic point of view, and there's been a backlash against that technocratic mode of governance. So that no longer works as something that the EU stands for. And then the second thing that it stood for was the social market economy. It was a particular socioeconomic model that did provide provide solidarity and so on, as you said, Natalie. And that's been hollowed out as, you know, basically Europe, led by Merkel, has tried to make itself more competitive. Um, certainly the social market economy has been hollowed out in the Eurozone periphery, but even in Germany this is the case. And so it's no longer credible to say this is what the EU stands for. And so I feel like now we're sort of searching for a new narrative, but it's actually a symptom of a deeper problem. And Again, to come back to something I said in the previous session, you know, I do think we, we need to be a bit more self-critical here because I think you know, all the three of you, in a way, have sort of... The, the story you've told you know, about the need for a narrative is about things happening to the EU. You know, the EU is a sort of passive victim of these you know, particularly you know, pernicious actors in international politics. But there's no sense of EU agency here, like how the EU has changed itself and how that's created some of these problems that then lead you to need a narrative, I think. And then the second point, which is related to that, um, I, I, I have to say something about democracy, because um, I think, again, this is symptomatic of a bit of a problem, that the only way now we can talk about democracy in relation to the EU is to talk about Hungary and Poland, right? For a long time, there was a completely different story about the deep democratic problems with the EU itself, the democratic deficit and so on. Now, none of those problems were solved. If anything, they've got worse. But what's happened since Hungary and Poland came along is now the, you know, that's displaced all the attention that there used to be on those deeper dem democratic problems in the EU. Um, and, and so we've simply <coughs> forgotten about the real democratic problems with the EU itself. And I think that's something else that we need to address before we can think about a narrative. Okay, and a third question on this side. Go ahead. You've got the mic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question about um, U.S. and European storytelling. There's a, a, a political scientist called David Campbell who wrote a book called Writing Security, um, which is fascinating. If 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 you haven't read it, he basically makes the point that storytelling isn't just a formulation of foreign policy. It also is a way of doing foreign policy. Um, it crafts foreign policy. And so he basically looks at National Security Council documents and he shows uh, very much what you were saying, Luke, that there's a sense of who we are is intertwined with who we are not. And so he looks at how through time the US has formulated um, the threat of, for example, the Soviet Union, uh, Jews, Indians, homosexuals. And he says these are formulated in the same way. They use the same linguistic categories. They use the same linguistic functions. They use the same concepts and, and, and categories. Um, so my, my, my question is uh, about the, the, basically the distinction between the US uh, narrative and the EU narrative. In, in a conversation that we had last year, uh, Luke, it was during the pandemic, it was on, 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 on Zoom. You made a really interesting point that the narrative of the US today is essentially autocracies against democracies. And that for the EU, this narrative was a bit dangerous insofar as the US is very good at storytelling because the US basically has uh, Washington, the Silicon Valley and Hollywood. So it has like uh, Lincoln, Woody Allen and Elizabeth Holmes. And obviously this capacity for storytelling is very seductive, is, is also very flawed. My question is, would you stand by this uh, today in view of what has happened uh, in the, the war in the, in, in the Ukraine? Um, how d does, the, does, does Europe, um, I mean, if you ask some academics in Oxford, Europe's enemy is not geographic, it's chronological, it's its history. Uh, Europe has no enemy, it's its history, and that's the root of the European peace project. Um, so does the US, sorry, does the EU today, does its narrative subscribe to this autocracy vs democracy um, storytelling? Or if not, what narrative does it craft if indeed it needs one? 
Okay, let's go back to the panel. Uh, pick and choose. <laughs> Natalie? Yeah, a couple of points. Um, I think, I Ivan, you make, you make a, a, a really good point there, both on the normative analytical, but also on the, the peace versus justice. Um, I think that the um, only way we'll be able to sort of s square that circle um, is probably by relying on Ukraine. I, I think they are the only ones that will be able to help us to um, somehow navigate that that contradiction. Um, we will not be able to do it without them. Uh, what I mean by this is that only, you know, sort of we will necessarily have to rely on what they will be able to accept um, as as a way of of, of of squaring that circle. And then on the um, so Hans, I mean on. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think I, I, if what you're saying is we don't really need the narrative, we actually need to solve some real practical problems. I actually think that a narrative is not the only way to do so, but it's also a way to do so. Now, I think that a narrative that enables you to solve some of those sort of internal mistakes, problems, etc., is one which, as I said, is one that embraces that those those contradictions. Um, so you know, I, 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 I you know I, I see where you're headed, but I think that a narrative is is part of that problem, uh, is part of that answer. I think that the difficulty, though, of a narrative that today embraces. I mean, it's a bit the conversation that we were having earlier. A narrative that today embraces that contradiction uh, is a narrative that is very exposed. Mm. I mean, you know, here we are expelling uh, in different European capitals um, people um, <laughs> that have been actively trying to subvert uh, our political systems. Uh, and I believe we're doing so for very good reason. So it's very difficult to embrace, you know, we, we are in a war. Uh, and I, although I think that a narrative should be, a, you know, the, the, the right narrative should be, or rather the narrative that enables you to um, address the problems of your past, uh, your, your mistakes of your past is one that embraces that contradiction. I, I think it is extremely difficult to do so uh, in in an age of war, which I think is basically what we're living. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the for the great uh, comments and and, uh, and and questions. The peace and justice is one of exactly one of those tragic uh, choices I, I alluded to. And uh, looking at this particular one, I think uh, in 2015 the Minsk II uh, Accords were there. The, with all the tension, they could still be brought together. Huh? But now, seven, eight years on in a horrible war, uh, the injustice uh, has exploded and, and the peace, as you say, has been discredited. So it will be, will be, will be very uh, difficult. Hans, um, I, I took the, uh, the assumption of the panel, uh, uh, yes, Europe does uh, need a narrative, but maybe also um, um, answering Julia's comment here, the way I understand it, it is in the sense of more of a self-image, self-understanding. Uh, so not maybe the way you also, Julia, tend to use it more as a narrative in, in terms for, uh, for a certain policy, why, why do we do it? But really, very basically, what is our place uh, on this planet? And what is our place in time? What is, what is actually our, our moment now? I mean, the Europeans have defined, we have defined ourselves for three uh, generations now as living after the war. But maybe now we have to change. Maybe now we, we, uh, we, will, we, we live before the war. Huh? Schultz has announced a Zeitenwende. We are entering a new era. He hasn't defined it, but, and obviously we only know afterwards that we now live before, but, but, but you see, there's, there's something like, yeah. like there. Now, this also, Olivier, brings me to your point of the uh, relation between the uh, US and, and the EU in terms of the narrative. I think the democracy versus autocracy, uh, s certainly it has a lot for it going in, 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 in the current context, and I'll, I'll spare you all the nuances and the details. 
Um, and it expresses something very powerful about our deepest values, to which also Zelensky appeals so successfully. But what it does, n what it does not do, and what is, is unable to do, is to express interests, our interests, and not only our values. And these interests uh, between the US and the EU, they are partly aligned, but partly not at all. And here I'm back to who we are and where we are as Europeans. It's a, simply a very different sp place in the world. And we are um, Eurasian, uh, the Americans, and regardless of what's happening here, they will continue their move away to China and to the Pacific. Uh, we will always be closer to Africa and the Middle East uh, than uh, the Seattle and, and California are today. And th this means this also in a world which is tragic and where we cannot have it all. Uh, means also other choices. And if we are unable to make those choices uh, on our own terms, we may reach the same conclusions as the United States in many cases, but not necessarily all the times. If we cannot make those choices ourselves, uh, we will be, in a way, reduced to the not so uh, uh, lead role of, of a vessel or satellite of, of, of the US. And this is why uh, I think we do need uh, a narrative to, to, to both be able to protect these values and interests, which are specific. Julia. Yeah, a couple of points. Um, I mean, on Ivan, justice versus peace, I totally agree. Um, but I do think that's a fundamental dilemma of, of international politics, right? Just how we have security versus freedom in the domestic sphere and so on. So that that is a, a difficult story to tell, but that's also what creates an interesting friction and you know that that's yeah the basic greek tragedy of what politics is right um on the language i think you're right and i, I guess again language is a is a living thing and and so is politics and this is where you discover new words others become taboos and so on so that i think what i would say there is look closely at which words are taboo and which words are we rediscovering and what does that tell us a about who we are but maybe also how like where we are going and and again how does that resonate uh, with the people that we're trying to reach right so are we using the right words um are, are we using words that we don't actually live by and and so on so and yeah it, it's 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 fascinating and i think that this what you're saying is sort of this this narrative of now the world war is coming back is of course also incredibly relevant for the European project in that it's a really young project and it's so all these wounds are being sort of torn open again as well. And, and so that's really difficult for, for Europe's story as well, because of course it's, it tries to portray itself as this peace project, but there's A, that story of peace is, is ambivalent. It hasn't been the same peace for everybody within Europe even, and it hasn't been the same experience, of course. Hans, do we need a narrative of what I've just written? <laughs> <laughs> my life, you know, <laughs> dedicated to storytelling and narrative. <laughs> but, um, so I think you know where I stand on that. But um, just to say, sort of, is Europe rediscovering now a narrative? And it's been this bureaucratic project, technocratic project. It didn't really need one. I mean, there's a reason why I talk about Aristotle, right? That we're not rediscovering narrative. Narrative storytelling has been part of politics since mm. the beginning of humanity. And I mean, that's also, Luke, you were just <laughs> alluding that. I did start my paper like that. It's like stories tell us who we are, like before we could even write, before we even had proper language. This is how we make sense of the world. So I do think this is a fundamental part of society and of politics. Um, but again, there can be different now how we tell that story. I think that's where it gets interesting, right? And sort of, a, and that's what I'm trying to tease out is that we've been this, uh, the European Union has been this kind of technocratic project and there was a logic behind that, right? Because we've had this hot war on the continent and the idea was to bureaucratize politics and to make it less virulent and to make it kind of boring, that was the whole point of it, right? So we don't kill each other the whole time. And then, of course, now, like with the way the, the world has evolved, this becomes incredibly problematic. And that's what I try to tease out. And having this kind of technocratic language in this deeply politicized world it, it is a real um, is a real problem. On EU agency, and are we talking about what's happening to the EU? Um, I mean, again, this is a panel about how does Europe tell its story, and it's a project on Europe's stories, and so on. So we're talking a lot about that. Um, 
I, I totally ag agree, I, actually, and I, I hope I made that clear in my paper. I mean, I problematized also the, the narrative. So in the, the interdependence narrative is problematic, that it only breeds peace, and that's got us into a lot of trouble. And I think that we're seeing now. I mean, we've seen nothing but the, the kind of risks of, of interdependence. But at the same time, we kind of don't get around it either, right? We still need to work with each other. <laughs> And there's no, so again, there you have the sort of Greek tragedy dilemma um, of that. So, uh, and, and the other one is, of course, colonialism. So I, I do think that we need to, and of course, Europe uh, creates its own problems as well. But so I, I don't, I, I hope, I mean, this is certainly not what I wanted to say, that this is happening to the Europeans. And now they need to dig themselves out of something. But that's exactly it, that you need to recognize your agency and, and also the, the ambivalent role that, that you've played in this in, in how you speak. And maybe that's where we get to Olivier's point on, on democracy versus autocracy. Um, and is this a useful framing? I find it very interesting that, that um, America's, I mean, in, of course, the narrative of democracy and so on has, has been part of the American narrative, also in very problematic ways, by the way, and, and justifying things that haven't resonated all so well in, in other parts of the world, of course. Um, but that it's, it's recognized as at a moment when it had deep fundamental problems with its own democracy, right? And living through a massive trauma still in what democracy has produced in America. <laughs> and, um, and I think in a way, that's maybe also then a way to come together with the Europeans. So we all have these challenges with it. Um, but I think, and, and again, I alluded to that uh, both in the paper and, and my talk, um, it's not that clear cut, right? You can't, this framing of democracy versus autocracy doesn't work when you're looking at, at Russia and the war in Ukraine because there are democracies there that are on the side of, of Russia now, at least not clearly in the camp of the Europeans and the Americans. And I think that's why it's, it, it's really not that useful a frame in terms of othering, for example, and so how do we go forwards now? Because, uh, and, and again, Viktor Orban calls himself an illiberal democracy and so on. So I, I'm not sure. It's, it's an interesting lens to look at the world. Is a good narrative to sort of frame who are we and who are the others? I don't, I don't think so. In a very authoritarian fashion, I will end this <laughs> panel here because we are well over time, nearly a quarter of an hour, and I do apologize to those of you who wanted to ask questions and, uh, uh, or make comments. Um, let me just say we uh, <laughs> a few words. Um, you know, when, when the sea was calm and the sailing was easy, namely when Europe was on a linear path forward, of course there was no, there was no problem with the various prime ministers, chancellors and presidents raising their hands in the EU Council and saying, we're going to the next step. As soon as the waters got rough, socioeconomic issues, you know, the, the, the Greek, uh, the economic and financial crisis, and then the migration crisis, suddenly you're in uncharted waters. And you're still under the pre presupposition that we are a continent at peace. Okay, the Yugoslav tragedy was relatively contained, but then, you know, we're back to war when war again should, should not have happened, even with the Yugoslav uh, thing. And so it is a Zeitenwende. It is, it is a complete upheaval of everything. That's why we're seeing all these, all these changes. And having been at the receiving end of a country that still is a candidate and wants to join, and I hope during my lifetime, maybe I'm you know, naive, but hopefully I'll live long enough to, to see that, it's that the European Union does not know how to sell its story. I mean, that's something that we've told a zillion European officials who have come through and in Brussels. Why do you not have a billboard going from Belgrade Airport into town which says the EU is with you or something? No, there's a Gazprom billboard where a Serbian and, Yugoslav and a Russian flag is intertwined. Uh, you know, I've asked, how much does this cost? Maybe we can, you know, put all, all the money together to have a, a European thing. It's very difficult to put conditionality on a billboard. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there's a little need for tender love and care in, in that sense. And that, that, I think, that's part of the narrative, I think. You know, how do you sell yourself? Uh, you know, on, on various buildings there is, but it's small and simple. Well, the Japanese donated yellow buses, and there's a big Japanese flag on there, and we all see these buses. Some of the European Union is... Describe the people who 
Sorry? Right yeah, yeah, you, you shouldn't play. So I, 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 think, I think it's extremely, um, it's extremely important. And what, what comes to mind about pathos and ethos, what comes to mind is Radek Sikorsky's famous speech, right? I fear a Germany, right? I, 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 how did he say it? I, I never thought I'd say that I fear a Germany that was mm. sort of in action, right. I mean, that was a real European speech. And apropos of who's saying it, a, a strong European leader, the foreign minister of Poland. You know, we, we, lack, we lack a bit of that. And uh, I wish Ursula von der Leyen would do a little more of that. But thank you, Julia. Thank you, Luke. And thank you, Natalie. Join me in thanking you.